So, good morning. Welcome to the fourth day of uh, for introduction to Fortran training. And uh, I hope uh, more people join soon. And two important logistics that one is we are recording and uh, we will publish these videos uh, later this session. And we use collaborative document to ask questions uh, and give answers. Uh, all the um, notes and slides are linked to the collaborative documents and we follow the carpentry code of conduct that means uh, use friendly language and being respectful to each other without much ado i will give to ule your instructor ule and we have a nice a breaker question you can talk about it a little bit and then start ule. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So all the participants will also hear you. So it's good. We have five. I hope for, for a few more to join, maybe a couple of minutes or some, some more to join. This is maybe the most important session that we have about functions and subroutines and, and class object and object oriented and so on. You want to take his, uh, have a short chat on this uh, icebreaker question? Probably. Yeah, we can. I I put it up here. I I I actually put in Lua. <laughs> Maybe I can ask Mike the same question. Which yeah. question is that? Icebreaker question. According yeah, to you, which program which language, language is the easiest to learn? Oh, ah, yeah. I well, I haven't learned all the programming language, but I think Python is. I when I learned Python, I thought it was lovely after C plus <laughs> plus. So well, I'm sure there's other languages that are easier to learn. C plus plus is a hack, so yeah, I hate it. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I like this uh, Python because I started to learn Python after I started Fortran, so it. It looks easy after you learn, uh, start a Fortran to go to Python. It looks easy to learn. And it, a little bit of R. R is also nice. There are very, very good reasons that Python is so popular because it is very easy to learn. But in some cases, I find Lua easier to, to use because probably because Lua is, is simpler. There are much less things in there. It's a very simple, it, it is, while it is Turing complete, it's a very small language. It's, it's a bridge when, when the shell, when the shell script become too complicated and you don't really want to embark on a large uh, Python project, Lua is excellent. And um, mm. so many of you have seen this QR code for so a long time. So, so, so um, yeah. If you haven't seen the movie, it's a good one. Um, again, I put up some some more links here for the language and 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 best practices and learn and so on. They are interesting to to take a look on and review on the best practices. So, fortranlang.org are are an interesting interesting web page to look on. Uh, there are many ways of doing things. There are several ways to skin a cat, so you can see what how I'm doing it, and you can watch the best practice there, and so on. But anyway, we have a lot of ground to cover today, so we'll go right at it. We start with functions and routine to start with, but we'll cover some interesting topics later on, and we'll touch upon object-oriented programming, and I will end by providing you a list of training that are offered by the different universities about object-oriented programming, because this is not my call. As I said repeatedly, I can teach you brick and mortar. I can even tell you how the cement work works, because I'm chemistry by training, but I can't, do, can't show you how to build a cathedral. That's somebody else's issue help me. I can teach you the tools. Anyway, there's a very, very important thing with, with Fortran. I've probably said it before, but in everything is by reference. 
So a variable name is a reference to a memory cell somewhere in the memory. So actually it's more like a pointer to a memory cell. Well, it's an address of a memory cell, which has some interesting implications, which will go right through it. First of all, we'll start with functions and then we go to subroutines. Functions are invoked by set by using assigning to a variable. As you see, a equals function of x, where a get assigned to the result of the function, like s equals square root of two or t equals the exponent of one, etc. X of one, etc. The input parameter should not changed, not be updated, or any other values should be changed. As you can probably guess, this is possible to do, since otherwise I wouldn't use it here. These are called side effects and can cause issues and errors. There's no end to bad things you can do if you really want to, but Fortran, nicely enough, provides us with mechanisms to do things safely and to prevent us from screwing up. As like in C, there are no safeguards to anything, so you can easily do do things you shouldn't do in C, and they might seemingly look excellent while when you are programming it, but then two years later, nobody understand why this didn't work, and it's not easy to spot. So Fortran has a lot of mechanisms to help us along, slapping us on the fingers if we do something that we shouldn't, and I have examples of that. Just to mention, I will only mention this today, uh, once there are a lot of built-in routines into the language, which comes with the language, it's uh, called intrinsic functions and subroutines. You can find them there on the online documentation for GNU. Uh, while GNU is some kind of standard for the language, be careful with the GNU extensions. If you try to use the GNU extension, they might not work with the Intel compiler or the the NVIDIA compiler, for those of you who are old in game, NVIDIA compiler used to be Portland Group PGI. So they might not work there. So be careful with the GNU extension. This list always uh, list very carefully, print out that this is a GNU extension. While some of them are cool, they are not portable. So in, in, in 25 years, your Fortran code might encounter a problem. And that could be because of a GNU extension that's no longer exist. Ha, brings us to the pure function have no side effects. <coughs> Sorry, I have some, some virus from, from Denver. Um, this is the keyboard pure preventing us from screwing up too much. So we'll see that in a couple of the examples, how that help us to write Fortran code correctly or without side effects. Like allocation, is not allowed, that could cause the system to run out of memory, running an allocation in a loop, and suddenly there are no more memory. And if you're lucky, your program is killed. If you're unlucky, the system reboots, which is not nice at all. And IO could, in principle, fill up the storage. Hence, it's not allowed in pure functions. Other effects, the compiler will flag as impure. So pure functions will be covered. Subroutines. They are called with the keyword call. You issue the, the word call and the name of the subroutine and some parameters, and data is exchanged with these parameters. They could be in, they could be out, they could be in out. And you need to specify whether or not these parameters are, are input parameters, output parameters, or both input and output. Or any variable is an address, and this is important as we'll see soon. This is how you call a subroutine, three parameters like in, out, and in, out. And it's also possible to have optional parameters so that you can have parameters that if you, if you provide them on the command line, the value you give is used. If not, there are either not used or you provide some default parameters. That's up to you when you write to subroutine, but it's possible to have op subroutines with optional parameters. Well, the function's true. 
your subroutines have no side effects. So as I said before, any assignment of input parameters and so on are not allowed. Allocation could run out of memory and IO could in principle fill up the storage. So same as for functions. And the compiler need to know how to call a routine. You have a routine or a function with some input parameters or input output parameters. And the compiler need to know the type, etc., of these parameters. Otherwise, you could go to classical C. You could have a function that expects a double precision number, eight byte, and you feed into the function a character of uh, a string of characters of eight bytes long that fit nicely into the double precision number with eight bytes, but function might not be too happy with having eight characters instead of, any, of um, a number. And nothing will prevent you from doing that. Fortran is strongly typed. There is no void pointers. There's no void whatsoever. Everything is strongly typed. So it prevents us from screwing up like that. Um, or an index of an array, which might be far off. And but that's one of the things that they have been compromising. If you run out of your index, if you declare an array from 1 to 100 and you try to assess the 101st element, that is OK, unless you get the segment violation. So there is no check on the array bounds. You can't force the compiler to put in like a debugging thing to check array bounds, but then the performance will be impeded. Maybe it's maybe twice as long runtime or something like that. That will cover next time. So it's possible to use an interface. This is a guide for the program, how to the how the parameters are to be used and what size they are, on type they are, etc. We'll we'll run through that on the examples. Which is and show you an example of um of an interface. Pure subroutine and multiply ABC. There are the ubiquitous implicit non, etc. And this is only only the interface. The actual implementation of the subroutine is somewhere else. So now if you give the if you put this into your program, the program will very well know, first of all, that it's a pure one, so it's safe to run it in parallel. And it also see that A and B are intentionally input parameters, and C is an output parameters. So interfaces are very useful, which brings us over to the examples. <coughs> I'm sorry. And um, I assume you have downloaded um, examples. You can play with them later. And we now go through the subroutines one through four. Um, I'll cover number three. Number three is con contiguous out um, layout that uh, all elements are back to back, so there are no gap in the array. They are all all in one stream, with with no um, no blank fields in between the elements and such, which is very important for performance. So there are ways that you can force the force the layout to be contiguous in memory, and we'll have an example of how you. <laughs> Sorry for coughing. Uh, how you do that. But we'll get right to it. I hope you can see my, first of all, you can probably also see my terminal and my Emacs window. Does it show OK? Yes. Fonts are OK? Yeah. OK. This is function number one, dot F90. And I declared a function. It's multiplied by two. It takes an input parameter A. It has a result B. This is a new syntax before you could put in the, the, the type before function. But then again, how do you know that you use the ISO Fortran environment, etc. with integer eight? So now they introduced that you can have a result is the B. Um, we call it upon the ISO Fortran environment. We say integer eight. 
Uh, there are a few people here around locally who say I'm crazy that insist on using small integers. But I've been programming a lot of Arduinos and small modules, and then you have to save space. But in 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 real life Fortran programs where your computer have a terabyte of memory, it doesn't care if you use four byte or one byte. If you don't need, if you unless you are uh, pressed for for memory, I print print out the input parameter. I set B, which is the result, to A times two. It's very simple program. Here I say. There is no interface. I just need to say that mul by two is of the type int eight. This is not really correct. And you see there are no check on the parameter, etc. So this one could fail. If I feed a character instead of a number, it will still work, but it's a bit unpredictable. But then again, character is eight bits. And there's a nice mapping between characters and numbers so but we'll we'll next examples will show a little bit more i'm loaded the module no i logged out so i need to load Mod well now i think we're up to three i i take the three i in all the examples say two but um i use the three We might have some more of the newer extension. D Fortran functions one. I'm lazy, so I don't bother to give it. Maybe I should now for once today give. And if you do the if you do, yeah, dot x or just function, maybe dot x for executable. This is this is there is no real good guideline. So how to do it? If you want to make a command. You could give it just like this. If you want to make sure that it's an executable program, you can call it dot x. In in real Unix tradition, it will be like this. So functions, and of course, I feed in. I print out d equal two. Here I print out a, so that's also two. Then I print the result of the function. Simple stuff, easy. Ah. You need to see what's going on. Functions two. Here is more or less the same, but I have introduced a little trick here. You see the input parameter I give here, and there's another interesting thing that you, we can do later on. Uh, I give them the D here. It's a variable D given in here as an input parameter to the function. I receive it here, change of name, but it doesn't matter. It's the same reference, the same memory cell, A, print out A. I multiply A with two, but then I set A to nine. First of all, this is very bad practice. It should be forbidden, and it will show how you safeguard against that. But everything is by reference. So the A here is the same reference as the one I gave in. So if I now run how this D variable suddenly become nine. I set it here and this is an input parameter which should be immutable, um, e.g. not about to change and not allowed to change, but I did. So this is a side effect and those are bad. There's nothing, well, you could swear, but I don't swear, try to not to. So be careful. So, how do we fix this? We have some, Fortran has provided us with a few interesting things. Here, I introduce the keyword pure. Pure means that there are no side effects. 
So any possible side effects that could come will be flagged by the compiler. I used the same before, A and result B, but I also included intention in for the A variable. So the A variable is an input variable. It can cannot be changed. If I try to assign A to something later on in this in the block of this program, it won't compile. And I can't print either because that's a side effect. So I'm not allowed to print. And of course, I'm not allowed to say A equals A, uh, A equals nine. But assume that we try to compile function number three. You saw I now I try to assign A to the variable to the number nine. Not allowed. So we need to which works. Two and four, the variable D is two. Of course it is because we are not allowed to change it in the function. But how can the problem, but I'll, so if we take the first example, to show you something interesting. I said that everything is by reference. A arriving here is a reference. But what will happen if I say 1.2 here? No, one, it's an integer. What would happen now? This is the first one. Type mismatch. You can do like this. Now we get an interesting thing. Yeah, and not. My mistake, it was the number two that did assignment. You see, I once had a program where deep down in the thousand, one thousand two hundred or something line, they had an assignment like this, and they have been calling this function with variables for years. But suddenly, somebody have changed the input here to some constant. And, of course, it failed. And it took quite a long time to get this one. So you see, this is an interesting one. Since I assign it up here, and the memory reference to a constant is not really something that is is valid, so it crashes. Even though the main program here seems to be nice, everything looks perfectly right here. But up here, I try to assign a constant with the, the value for number nine, which is totally wrong. So again, a side effect, which you should safeguard against. And if we now go to Number four. You see, I have declared it pure. You already did this in the number three, but then I included an interface. So now the program will know that this is a pure function and how the parameters are supposed to be. It's supposed to expect an integer the eight, a uh, uh, single byte integer, A, and expect an output of the same kind, of the same type, which we'll do here. So we can compile the number four. It will be just like all the others, one, two, two. Yep, D equal to, multiplied by two is four, and I print F and D which is exactly as we expected. So this is a simple pure functions and so on. We'll can also cover some subroutines. Let's 
see, we have subroutines one. We need to check if they are there. Here I have made a subroutine called mul multiply two, which is multiplying A and B and put the answers in C. I put in intention in, so only A and B are input parameters and C is the output parameter. I print, printing is allowed since it's not a pure subroutine. I included an interface how to show how these are done. I call it, you need to use the keyword call to call a subroutine A, B, and C. And of course, A, B, and C are references to the three variables. So far, it's not so hard. Ah. So we get two and five, two and five, fine. And I got two, five, and 10 because I also printed here A, B, and C. So this is the simplest, more of one of the more simple way to call the subroutine. <coughs> we can have one more. We extend it even a little bit more. We use pure, pure subroutine, of course, it's not allowed to print. And we have put in the keyword pure here, so we know that these have no side effects, which also means that in principle, it's possible to run two of these in parallel without interfering with each other. So it could be run safely in parallel. It will just give the same, same output as this one, except one less line that comes from the subroutine. If you put in prints in subroutines, I encourage you to, to put in the name of the subroutine also, so you know where it printed from, not just the number. So here you will say mul2 in parentheses or whatever, so that you know where it got printed from. It's an ID bugging feature. So we can try subroutine three. This is has more to do with performance than than anything else. But this is an interesting one performance wise. I checked here whether or not these vectors are contiguous, so they have no gaps. This is a built-in function as an intrinsic function that can check if they are. If you declare a normal, normal um, vector like here, here I say. In the program, I have integer eight, a single byte integer, a dimension is unknown, it's, but it's allocatable. So I allocate six elements of each. A, is, have a, a vector A has six elements, B six, C six. Then I say A equals two, and all the elements are two, for same for B and C for zero. So we check whether or not the vectors are contiguous in the main program. Um, we call the subroutine with, if you remember your vector syntax, we call it with every second element. So A to N, I'm just omitting it, and then two, which is the, the step, so every second element. So we call vector A, we just mask out half the element so vector a is every second element of course this vector is not contiguous um we'll see what happened when we come to the first subroutine we'll ask are the vector contiguous and then the second one we force them to be so so we say that this has to be contiguous what happened then is that when it encounter vectors in A, B, or C that are not contiguous, they will make a copy, a local copy that is contiguous, and then work on that and then copy back when the program has done. It 
requires two copies, a lot of more and um, more memory, but the performance could be much better. And if you have continuous vector in the in the first place, then there will be no problem. You you will not have any issues with them um, with copying and so on. So we can try subroutine three. On the uh, next um, event, I, I will show you how much this can play out in performance-wise, the penalty for doing so. So here are the first two vectors, A and B. Of course, they are continuous by the allocation in subroutine. One, are the vector continuous, A, B, and C? No. And you see there are we call them with every second element, they are not contiguous here. No and no, and you see then on the where they have been multiplied are 10, 10, and 10. The others are zero. The others are have, can't keep their values because they have been, they are just the references to the same variable, so they will a and B will, will be, if you print the whole, whole thing, they will still continue to have their values. But if you go to the other ones where in, in the number two, you see they are continuous. They are true, true, true. In, in, the, in the second one, it comes up with true. So, it could be a nice thing to enforce performance-wise, but more on that later. But I thought it was a good thing to, to include it when we introduce, when we are playing with subroutines and functions in the first place. So we'll um, continue. Maybe I could ask for if there's any questions at this time. Yeah, a function is is something that you when you assign a variable to the outcome of a function. So there's no call involved. The function is called by, by the fact that you assign it to a variable. So you say, like you take the square root, you can say uh, i or a equals square root of two. Then you are assigning the variable a to the outcome of the function. And the parameters are only input parameters. While a subroutine, is something that you need to use the keyword call. You call a subroutine, but you invoke a function. So when you call the subroutine, you provide provide the um, input parameters. And if you need something back, you also provide output parameters. So functions communicate by, by um, giving us an outcome of the function and a subroutine it uh, communicates with the rest of the program by by way of parameters into the function into the into the subroutine okay uh, correct me if i'm wrong because uh, i learned it the 77 standard so uh, when i was learning i i i understood function as uh, do some calculation means uh, take number of values or arguments and do some calculation and then return a single result am i right yeah, but you can also return an array or a pointer or or a more complex thing. Like a, if you if you return a pointer, that's a pointer to some could be a very complex object. But mm -hmm. yes, normally a function is something that just return a single number, but it can return an array. Okay. Yeah. That's. But it that's... return it return it's the return value who is the outcome of the function. Yeah, and uh, there are intrinsic function and also, um, what do you call it? external functions? Yeah, right. external functions is an interesting thing that we yeah, mm -hmm. because they are you shouldn't really use the keyword external function because then that's not so smart. But the, you should use an interface to inform about that. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I also use the external, but you shouldn't use external, the keyword external. But mm -hmm. no. my second, for example, is a very, very much used external function, which is a double precision thing that gives a timestamp. And then next time you call it, it's a different timestamp. So you just 
subtract them and get the top. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, and, yeah, and but you're right. Subroutines sub can return several results, uh, not only the single value, like including the array. Yeah. Right. And um, we cannot uh, put the call on subroutine uh, in, inside an expression. Am I right? And um, that's also true, but yeah, because the uh, there is no outcome of of the subroutine, so you you cannot put in a subroutine because a function can be like a variable. Mm -hmm. So you could say some, you could put a long expression and have a function in there, but you can't do the same thing with the subroutine. Some subroutine is calling a sub program. Yeah, and it is not uh, required to. Uh... Uh, declare in the main program, right? Like function. No. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, if I remember correctly, there should be any return or end. Uh, no, you don't for... have to. You don't need. You need an end, but not return. Okay. Yeah. Return okay. is removed in the newer standard because it's obvious that you have to return by when you reach the end. So there is no return. Okay. If you yeah. try to put in a return, you get an error because then, because in the old days. Yes. There were people having an if test and then say return in the middle of the block. Mm -hmm. You can imagine how much uh, problem that would arise. So don't use uh, return as a control structure. Use the cycle, um, cycle, break, or or exit, or yeah. No, it's cycle or exit and or, or if then else construct. Yeah. So and, yeah, they, even in the old days, you could have entry points. You could have an entry point in the middle of the subroutine. If you call it with that name, you will will enter the subroutine halfway through. So yeah. this is also very very bad practice. So that's discontinued. But yeah. you might see it in in Fortran seventy seven programs. Yes, yes, I did that. That's why I was remembering that return, but. Yep. But thanks. Uh, there are I... some, a lot of things have happened in the last years preventing stupid things from happening. That's good. But you might see it in old code. Yep. Yeah, that's my, my model code is, code is 77 standard. So I yep. know. And there's a lot of program in 77 standard. So they should be updated. When, mm -hmm. when people are bored and procrastinating, you use the time to update the program. So, well, we have to continue. We have a lot of stuff to cover. Yes, uh, thank you for yep. explaining. I will update that note. Yep. Um, recursive functions that are functions calling themselves, which is an interesting interesting thing. Um, a very famous example is the Fibonacci number. And the Fibonacci numbers are, the next one is the sum of the two previous ones, like here, Fibonacci of n minus one plus Fibonacci of n minus two. So this is, a, 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 but if we are going to write a function to do this, it will call itself within the function until the, you are, until the n has become one and then you return because then you just return one and wind yourself up. The <laughs> point is that a function, a normal function, will will um, only use um, provide one set of variables. So if you call a function and use variables in there, the next time you call the function, it will you still use the same variables, same memory space, and same, mem same cells in memory. So it will overwrite and that calling itself will not work. Um, this has to do with performance. Again, everything in Fortran is, it, it has to do with performance. So if you really an, insist <coughs> sorry, on writing a recursive function, you, you need to use the keyword recursive. But then again, if you do that, you could have a very nice function. So in this functions number five, I am, um, I have done actually that. Of course, I know that many of you who are participating would love to have time to run these things yourself during the training, but then the training will be 10 times as long or five times as long. So 
I would really love to have a workshop for over many, many days, but there is no time to do that. So unfortunately, I have to run the examples for you and you have to review them yourself as homework. So the recursive function Fibonacci, here I use integer 32, a little bit longer integer. If n is less than less or equal to 2, you just return n. Otherwise, you call your the function itself with a smaller n and then minus 2. And that's it. Simple. I also provide an interface. Then I run 30 numbers. I print 10 of them on each line. So when you run out of numbers here, it will, if you run, when you have written 10 numbers, it will be printed out. And if you are, if mod by j is divided by, it's divisible by 10, and the mod is, is zero, then it's divisible by 10, uh, you will print a new line. And then I just, for, for a, a, a fun fact, uh, remind you that the golden ratio number is Fibonacci numbers divided on each other, which is an interesting, for those who are interested, can look up on the golden ratio. So, but the golden ratio is, is Fibonacci numbers, a uh, fraction of the Fibonacci numbers. So, how does this work? D Fortran function five, You see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 5, 8, 13, et cetera, et cetera, up until here. And you get an estimate of the golden ratio. So this is how Fibonacci sequence work. So a recursive function, which can be quite nice. There are examples on, on using recursive functions, like in sorting and so on, but at least you have now seen how you can like them to do n factors and so on. There's a lot of, sometimes the recursive function, a lot of problems that are very nice to write in recursive functions, but you need a keyword uh, recursive. Okay. Any questions? Understanding how recursion functions work could take some brain brain exercise. Okay, no question. Then we continue with a marvel of, of a modern Fortran. It's called elemental functions. Those are really I, I learned from 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 a Fortran expert the other day that this is where it really it really shines that you can have these kind of functions. Um, in C++, this is impossible. I learned I haven't really tested it, so I have to take his word for it. Um, it takes input of various length and ranks. So you can more or less feed in everything to an elemental function. Operations are done element by element. So if we have a sum, for instance, we see that uh, S equals A11 plus B11 plus A21 and B21. You see the indexes are identical. So element by element. And regardless of, of the rank and size of the two, two arrays. But of course, they have to be of, of the same, they have to be of the same total length and ranks. They can be in have any have any rank up to fifteen. So if you feed in two vectors like add int, which is the my example, then it will multiply. It will add one to four, two to five, and three to six and take any ranks and dimension. So 
we'll take a look at function number six. This could be very, very powerful in when you write bigger programs because you sometimes you want to operate on arrays and you can write a function that can take in arrays of different dimensions. So here I say A and B, they are of intention in both of them. And the results are R, a simple function that return something, a single entity or a single pointer because it's only a pointer to some place in memory. Or a pointer which we use pencil and paper, which is more relevant for science than actually knowing what the inside and inside of the memory things and so on work in the computer. A plus B. Then we have element um, elementary function. We have the J, okay, and then we have a dimension, a two by two matrix. It's called A. And we have a two by two by two matrix called B. And we give the interface so that we know how to call it. And then we feed in scalars, one plus two. And you can see we use all constants here. We have seen how bad things go if you try to assign something later on with a non-pure function. Um, but I could have used a pure elementary, pure ele uh, uh, pure elementary function, but I didn't, but you could use the keyword pure. So I feed scalars, I feed a small vector, one with two numbers, I add them add element by element. I feed in a bit longer vector, and then I feed in a vector of length five. Here is I use the implied do loop inside the vector to set the vector with one, two, three, four, five. And the other one is j plus j, so it's two to ten. I set some number. I set the first two columns in in um, in a to one and two, and then I I do a trick here. This one you need to to play with yourself, but we covered reshape earlier on. But I have I have I feed into reshape first a vector of with element size of B. The size of B is two by two by two. So B here is a size is eight. So I feed in eight elements, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But I know that I need to reshape it to the correct size, which is two by two by two. So I ask for size of B first rank, size of B again, but this time the second rank, and size of B the size of the third rank. And then I print it. So this line here is a bit tricky, but this one you need to, to, to review and figure out how it actually works. So we'll see what happens if we pick number function number six. So scalars three, vector four and six, three element vector five, seven, and nine. Five element vector, three, six, then to 15, two by two, two, four, two, six, four, and, the right, and then the two by two cube, two, four, six, eight, then up to 16. So this function will take, sorry, there, this simple function will add fields or vectors or, or arrays or whatever you like to call it in any dimension and any rank element by element. Again, a very, very powerful here with just one single line. I can add element by element of any kind of fields that you put in. So this one is, is, is 
is a really interesting one. So there's no end to the nice things you can you can play with this, and you can write a function only once. Because if you want to do something with some some field, you can use this kind of function and only write it once, regardless of what you are going to feed in of the ranks and sizes of your input. So this is a nice one. <clears throat> Should be a lot of exercises about this, but time constraints preventing us from doing it properly. Then it's an even interest, more interesting one. The argument to a routine do not have to have a fixed type. I said that Fortran is strongly typed. It is but we really want to make a generic function or subroutine that can accept any predefined type. Predefined means that it's known. So if you have your own type, you have to declare the type before you, you embark on this game. So we want to swap A and B. This is typically when you are doing a bubble sort, you check if that one is bigger than that one. If they are, you swap them. Um, so look up bubble sort and, and, and look on swap. Um, A and B could be integers. There are several integers. There are single byte, two byte, four byte, and eight byte. <coughs> they are different types. You have real numbers. They come in two flavors, um, single precision and double precision. And you have complex numbers. Of course, you could have characters also. So they, and then the complex number comes in two flavors, single precision and double precision. So there's many, many swap functions that you might be forced to make. And in the old days, this was impossible. So you will come across swap function that will call I swap for integers. Then uh, um, uh, R for real. D for double, C for complex, and Z for double complex. So you have to write five different routines for this. This, what I will show you now, is you can do this with only a single routine called swap. And the one I've made take integers real or complex. You could extend it to whatever type you would like to have. So you, we learned before that you can make your own type. So swap demo. And if for those of you who pay attention, you see that I used capital letters, capital letter 08, because now I'm introducing something that's only available in Fortran 2008. And there's nothing magic with that. It's just that I use some macros. So swap demo. But Well, here is something strange. Here's something that, that you haven't seen. Here, there is no, no, no swap routine defined. Because if you see here, I you say use SWP. Uh -huh. Swap module. So this, here are the magic going on. The module called swap, we, SWP. We have an interface to swap. The mod, uh, module procedure contains swap R32, that's real 32-bit. Swap R64, that's real 64 bits real. 32-bit complex. 64-bit complex, integer 32-bit. I haven't bothered to take the 16 and 8. And long int, which is I64. Uh, a, a short notice about long int. Long int in C, uh, the standard doesn't say very much about the sizes of these, but convention is that a long int is capable of holding a memory location. So for most of the computers that we use, Long is 64-bit. 
But if you go to small cards like Arduino, you might encounter that the long is only 16 bit. So, but for normal purposes, um, long is 64. But in Fortran, this is not the problem because we we um, we use do it the proper way. We use either real 32 or we specify our own double precision, single precision number where this is set to what we would like it to be. As you remember from the first, if you want 16 decimal places, you call, you ask for that and don't care about how many bits that is. If you need 15 or 16 decimal places, you just call for it and you get a handle to that variable. But here I use the ISO Fortran environment and say real 32. Intention again. Then I say kind of A, which is comes in here. Since I need a temporary variable, I have no idea what the variable what a variable is, so I say the kind A, kind of A, and then I got the temp uh, and, and variable that is exactly the one same as A. In this case, it's real 32. But then I do a clever trick. I sh think we have covered this before, that you can use this uh, C pro preprocessor to expand this construct into this. So SWP are a text manipulation tool that the, the, the C, pro, C preprocessor will take the SWP and expand it into temporary and e equals X, X equals Y, and then Y equals temporary. And when you, when the code come to the compiler, after pre being pre-processed, it will say instead of SWP, it will say temp equals X, etc. Same go for the 64 and the complex. And for the integer, I, I didn't use the macro just to show you what the macro will expand to. Just to show you how you can use the macros. And long int. And then this is what you have to write in your library, but this is only once, never again. And then when you're using it, you just call the, use the SWP module, call swap. A and B are integers. C and D are long ints. X and Y are, are, are float. Z are double precision float. U and, and V are double precision complex. And I played around with the format statement here. So it's a <laughs> it's a long format statement. I run into trouble with the format because I had 40 here and suddenly things didn't work. It crashed on strange places. It turned out that I had too short format. The format length wasn't really long enough. So I included a trick how to check the length of your format string, the actual length, where you use trim and then see in this case it's 51 bytes. So I could change the length up here to 51. But if you set it very long, then you can use this print this function when, and test how long the actual string is. Or you can sit here and count the characters one by one, which is boring. So this is a way just to test how long the string actually is and trim off the blanks. Print out before and after. So we run the swap demo. After the swap demo, there is a break. So D Fortran swap module because we need to compile the module also and swap demo. works and you can see that the numbers are swapped so the swap function can't handle any number but of course in the backhand you need to provide a routine for any any kind of, of variable so 
it doesn't help to be lazy, but it helps to be lazy that you only need to do this once. And when you run your program, your function will handle anything. So you have to do it once in your library and or uh, your module. But then again, when you first have done it, you can invoke it or you can call the function and call the subroutine with almost any kind of, of type. So this is called polymorph type, where the type can be anything. And you can write a polymorph function or a subroutine that take any kind of, of type. There's no end to what you can extend it to be, but this is the normal, normal things that you will, you will probably encounter. So Maybe it's time for a break, Tanya, maybe, or you want to go, should we continue? We can, we can take a break if we feel that. Uh, shall we take a break until 20 past 10? Yeah, because I think we have covered a lot of, of stuff that needs some 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 time to, to get into the brain and then need to be pre-processed um, in the brain for a few days because it's a lot of, of interesting things. But if we'll take any questions, if there, if we have... Uh, we don't have more questions. The one uh, I answered. And yeah, I see. We could go for a break and come back 20 past 10. Yeah. <laughs> no, there are even more intellectual challenges coming. Um, the whole of this is to make it easier for to write for down programs and to make them more powerful. So you don't really have to deal with indexes and such that you can do more in one go. So more extending on the vector syntax where I can set, like I have a, a three by three by three cube, and then I can set all the elements to to random numbers with just a single line, instead of having to run through through uh, as nested loops, etc. So all of the modern things after two thousand and three has been to make functions and subroutines and and dealing with things in a more powerful way. And then we want to write something, a function or a, or a routine, which is the the bag for 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 all kind of uh, subroutines or or functions, use procedures or or routines. Um, that can take in any dimension, any any rank of of or any dimension, any dimension and any rank of an array and deal with that. So here I'm having an example where we have one thing is we don't know the dimension of the array, how many elements there are, but we don't know the rank either. So I say the dimension dot dot, we mean that, that I don't really care about the dimension and how many elements or the rank of the array. Now we are starting to get very, very powerful way of dealing with, with, with things that we can call a function with an array of any dimension or an, and any rank. So I made some more examples about assumed rank test. So we, we all assumed rank test one. I had a function called add add v. It takes in a and um, integer thirty two, but I have no idea about what kind of rank or size the user sent in to me. I have to assume that it, that it's some kind of, of, of indexed variable, an array of this this type. But we could also have a, a polymorph type that we covered before. So I can print out. I always allowed an impure function, so I can print out the rank. So there's a way or in intrinsic function that can help me with me with the rank. So I can print out the rank I then and then the shape. 
how many elements per per rank. But then there is no free lunch. So we need to make sure that each one of the different cases need to be handled. So when it comes, when it boils down to the actual implementation of the actual thing, we still have to deal with the separate entities once for each rank. So if the rank is zero, it's just a variable, a simple variable, then we just return the variable. But if rank is one or two up to four, I use a function called sum. This is an intrinsic function that sum up all the elements. And I didn't bother to go all the way to 15. So I just said default, and then I, I set it to minus huge, which is the, the biggest number that you can have and do it negative. So minus infinity, so to say. But since integer is a fixed number on this one, so. So, but now I can have, this is a simple thing. I also took something that that takes an array of any kind of, of um, ranks, 1D, 2D, 3D. I didn't bother to do more than 3D. But assume that you give the two by two by two array and fed that into here, it will come out as a one, one to eight. So I check the rank. If it's one, I reshape it. If it's two, I reshape it to a one dimensional array, etc. <laughs> so I can feed in any kind of of array here with any kind of, of um, dimension or rank and reshape it into a 1D array. So we have an interface and the main block starts here. This is the A and we can see what is A. A is two by two by two and B is just a single, <coughs> single dimension array or, or a single rank a one-dimensional array of, of some size that we don't know that we need to allocate. So we, um, we um, call the function add v and get the sum of a. I set all the elements to a in one go here. Then the next line, I allocate B with the size of A, and then I I need to, size of A is the total size of, of the A, even though it's a two by two by two, it will be eight. And then I allocate a vector B, which is single dimension, one to eight, and call flatten, and we'll see that it will come out as expected, hopefully. So we can try to run. I really encourage you to go through through these um, examples later on. Assume rank test was it one? Was it two? One. The I/O system is slow, but it's all so. You see, I got rank of A is three, two by two by two. And then the rank of argument is three, shape of argument two, 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 and the sum is eight. Then the flatten size of A is eight that we knew before, and of B is eight. But these are the sizes. A has two by two by two, B is 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 eight so and one by eight, and then we we get in two sizes. Rank of x is three, shape of x two by two by two, size of y is eight, and then when it return, we return the size of b is one and the shape of b is eight. It's only eight, so size of b is also eight. So we print out one through four, two to two. two. 
which is what expected since it's two here. I put in only twos. So now we have a subroutine, a function, uh, a subroutine here that can take in X of any dimension and any rank. Assume that two. I did the same with pure functions so that there are no input or output. I just changed it so they are pure. And then I need to print out a little bit more down here. But I also did one more. I um, I wanted to get the number of ranks and so on of them of the A. So get dimensions of A is uh, how do we get the dimensions? There are two ways of doing it. This is one of them. So we can see that. So what is the dimension of A? Assume rank test two. So we wanted to see what the dimension of A is so two and three and four, which is this right. I declare the dimension of A is two, three, and four. So this is just a way of getting hold of those. This is one way of doing it. I This is also, see, I, I, I do some fancy allocating of another vector and so on to print it out to hold the elements. So, and then I thought it should be possible to do it simpler. Um, it is. This is the same thing with just a simple way of of um, of uh, getting hold of um, of the ranks. Here I just say a j equals one. Do while j equals the rank of a. I print them out, and here I use the size a of j, which is run from one through through the ranks. And then I, I called another one that made another interesting routine here that actually squares. I squeeze you just squaring the number. I have x equals x times x up to four, just to make a, a, a one more example. And two, three, and four. And then we can see what happened. I fill up the vector two times j. And then we square, and then we print it out again. Um, the first one works nicely. It adopts the vector to 72. And 24 elements of, of the 2 by 3 by 4. I get the shape of A is 2 by 3 by 4. I get the B is 24, since it's a single rank. And size of B is 24. And then I print out some numbers. Every fourth number gives us five trees. The dimension of A is two by three by four, yes. Then we subroutine to square an array, vector is rank three, 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 and nine, nine, nine. And then we, after we square it, we get two, four, six, two, eight, six, 64, which is what I filled in here. Again, they imply do loop. <laughs> so, this is, again, a very, very powerful construct where you can have, where you can have dimensions or rank unknown. This is a fairly new addition, so, but it's one of the more powerful things. Right. Questions? Let's see if there are any.
no questions. Yeah, I see. When you give it a thought, you will see how powerful some of these constructs are. They might be okay, nice to see, but if you sit down and, and, and review how things are working, these constructs can become very, very powerful. <laughs> so, especially that you can write very, very general and generic routines that can handle most kind of input that you have. So you only need to write it once and then you can use it in your program. Right. Continue. Yeah. Which brings us over to something I covered before, modules. This is the next step to much more object orienting things. A module is where you place things like variables, constants, functions, subroutines, etc., and compile them separately and put them into a module. And you can say use calc in this, this example. It's the word use is the keyword. And you said use calc. Um, calc and anything in that module will suddenly become available or the ones the one things that you have decided that should be available because you they can either be public or private if you use the word private any everything is private unless you have explicitly made it public so you can hide all kinds of variables in there and only expose methods to deal with the data. So the classical object-oriented programming is that you are not allowed to touch the variables that you have. If you have a climate model or something, things with a lot of data, arrays, etc., you should not be allowed to touch the data in your main program. There should only be methods to manipulate the data which is a bit strange, but this is object-oriented programming for you. So there should only be methods, which is subroutines and functions to deal with the data. But in practice, you always run, you always access the data. But in, in the hardcore object-oriented programming, the only thing that could manipulate data is the methods. So I did some more demos to illustrate this. Unfortunately, well, I will discuss this in the break that there should be more time to, to, to run these examples yourself. But then if we set aside time to that, you we I wouldn't be able to to cover as much stuff that or much things that um, I would like to do. So it's a it's a trade-off, unfortunately. So we take a look on the first module. Module one. Here I declared a module called my routines. It contains a function, pure function called mul by multiply by two. The only thing it does is to multiply the input with two and give the answer out. So and I have intention, so they know that we can change the A, so it's pure and it only returns B, which is the result. Then I don't need an interface because this module are, when it's a module, these are, this is contained in the mod file so that my program will know how this function look like. So I can say only use my routines, use the Fortran environment, none, declare two integers, assign six to the integer printout, multiply it by two. So my own main program is only this. So anything else is hidden here in this one. In this case, it's very simple. So we'll try to compile module one. Of course, this is so simple that it's, yeah. Nice. Now we have encapsulated or we have got rid of this because this could be in a different file. So we, now we open up module 
two, again, my module test, but now there is no module here. So this is the only thing that's in my program. Use my routines and then mul by two. So how does this work? Yes, we have to we, we call this one, but then we have to compile. We have to compile. We can do it in two goes. We can say my routines dot mo two dot f, but there is no main here. <clears throat> so what do you think happen if I try to compile this? Anyone's guess what happened if I try to compile this? No one there to take a chance on this one. Yeah, but uh, let us see. Probably, uh, uh, yeah. But I'm not guessing. I want to see. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, try to guess. I mean, you can stick up. What happened if you try something where there is no main? There will say no main error message. No main, and uh, yeah. Correct. So, we can say that we will just compile. Voila. Uh -huh. Now we can say my routines, and then we can say my routines.y, which is the object file. Uh, of course. Huh? Didn't I compile my routines.c? It should be. Yeah. Uh, like this. So this can be a library now, the minus O file. That could be a library that pre-compiled and you can copy it to your friends and, and have it lying around. So the only thing you need to do now, next time is to just link in that library. Put it on the command line with, with the O file and link it in and then we have an executable. For those of you who are interested, there is a trick you can play. My routines 2.0. It will see that it will have it a true, that it's T for true. And this is the name of the function that are in my routines mod module world by two. But this is a, a, a more a Linux thing than anything else. So this works nicely. Module three, we can play a little bit more. What did I do here? Maybe I did something, a mistake here and have the two, two at the same time so that A little, little difference between the two. Yeah, I think two and three are the same. That's my mistake. We copied once and one extra. Sorry for that. So use my routines and to write a module. Didn't I have the module here? Here. But I also have a my routine stuff. Three. Ah, yeah, sorry for that. Of course, the main programs are identical. It's the my routines two and three that are different. Sorry for that. My routines are here. Module my routines contains pure function mul by two. Nothing special here, but myroutines.3 have a different module. 
here I say I use the ISO environment and in non you can put it up here also to 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 so they will they will apply the whole module so you don't have to to do it down here. Um private everything is private. So you won't see any variable. You cannot access the variable A and B and so on. The only thing you can access is null by two. So the only way of changing and dealing with the data is the method called null by two. So this is a way of, of doing object orientation where the only way of dealing, uh, of accessing or change or update or whatever with the data is by the methods. This is the, the essence of, of object-oriented programming that you should encapsulate all the data and only use the methods. So here is how you do it. You declare everything as private and only public those few things that are to be exposed to the user. <laughs> so if I say my routine module number three, I say use my routines, and the only thing I can access is this one. And it works nicely. So if I say module three, and then I can compile both of them at the same time on the command line, you don't have to do it in two steps. Which brings us over to something that we'll cover in another session with, with make files. Right, six and 12. And we have a module four. Module four, and here the is a function a, a subroutine two, and we need to call up. We need to call up my routines four. So what's in here? Okay, what's here? We have my routines. So there are many things in here. It's the mul by two, mul two, and fib. I put the Fibonacci in here too. So it contains a pure function multiplied by two. We put in a pure subroutines that multiply A and B. And I also, just for fun, included the Fibonacci routine. <laughs> All of those are in this module. And if I want to use any of those, I can just call them, use use my, and then call the functions. So we can compile that one. Modules is a very nice way of, my, of putting libraries together and um, this is interesting. Declare reference of mul two. Hmm. I expect it because I normally try to check all of them. Uh, uh, mul by two and mul two. This one mul two. Range. Doesn't matter. Now it works. So we um, have the functions and we call them mul by two and 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 first this one is is a typical function where it returns something. The call doesn't return anything. It it also only deal with the um, data back and forth during with with uh, with parameters, and of course the G here is the only output one. So mul by two mul two. A and B are input parameters, yes, and C are an output parameter, and C equals A times B, which is right. So this is a simple introduction to modules. Any more? Questions about modules?
is all clear? Yeah, that's so. Or is it just too overwhelming that you need to review the videos three times before you 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 come up with questions? I I I I don't know. It can be. It's a lot of it's a lot of interesting com concepts here. So it takes some time to 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 be acquainted with them. I see it can be overwhelming a little bit, but uh, um, it is interesting at the same time. Maybe we um, if we work on it a little bit, then we'll come. We'll have more questions. Yes, there is one question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So no question, but it's no, a clear it's... explanations. <laughs> Good, but I encourage people to spend some time because it's. Um... The newer things in Fortran contains a lot of intellectual stuff that people work on. I have some some papers I got from from um, not not a colleague of you, Dan Danya, but but Mang um, the He he's in Bergen. He's working on on Fortran. He's in the committee, and he has a paper here from 2019 reflecting on the generics of Fortran. And generic routines is exactly what we just did, where you can have polymorph argument in both type and ranks, etc., so that you write a generic function that hopefully can take all kinds of, of, of input and deal with it. Hmm. So... Yeah, but uh, I just want to uh, say that it is okay to be overwhelming. So I feel sometimes overwhelming <laughs> because coming from Fortran 77 standard and I expect someone... Uh, like me, feel the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The language is becoming very, very modern. So, yeah, and then we continue. Yeah. So now we are coming closer and closer to the object orientation, and yeah, we have ten minutes to a break again. The simplest example is a linked list because now we introduce there some more object orientation and and one thing is they call they when you learn simula and uh, as i did python for for the modern and modern people and and, and so on or c++ um garnet stands to wrote c++ when he has sabbatical that stanford might be i think it was stanford yeah, so but and then he he knew Simula very well, and he wanted to to add the object orientation objects to to C and call it C plus plus. So it's a hack; it's not really constructed from the bottom up. Anyway, um, linked lists are one of the core things that you do. It involves pointers and object, and object can be as complex as you like them to be. And you have pointers to them, and then you can just have many objects, and they can have methods, they can have data, they could be a quite interesting collection of things that you can do. Um, we'll start with a very simple object, progressing into an object with procedures to handle data and hiding the internal data from being accessed by the user, public, private variables, and procedures. And complex in the meaning of mm, in, in many elements not complex numbers but complex in mean that there are a lot of things in the in the object so there are six demos in here and we will we'll take them piece by piece so like the if how do you eat an elephant piece by piece so simple objects one now we are into object-oriented programming. Well, we already have with, it's touched upon it. So this is a module called Calc, calculations, the variables here. And then we are attributes where you use the percentage sign that's already been shown before. That way you have the longitude and latitude thing. But now we have in the module, we have a public type called stat, which is a real 64 dimension allocatable array called X. Then there are some methods. It contains methods. And here I have done it in the old fashioned way. 
but it's doable because I have the use ISO Fortran environment up here. I have said that this function is a real 64 function called mean. You could also use the result. I encourage you to use result instead, instead of real 64. <coughs> uh, before the function. So this one is, it's not really kosher. It, it, it is, it's working and it's okay, but it's not really the really correct way. It is okay, but it's not really the correct one. Depend on how, 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 how touch, touch you should be on the syntax. So we declare some variables, intention, unknown length, input, and there's a variable called sum. And there's a helping variable called j. Of course, you could have just said sum here with using the intrinsic function, but I wanted to have a loop to show that you use size of x and then make a sum. And then we say mean is equal sum divided by with size. So instead of having a function called here, you could set n, you could set size x to n and then use, use um, n instead. I'm not sure if it really matters much because I think that will be cached anyway. Then the end of module calc. And then we we um, declare a variable called st, which is of type stat. We don't need to do anything fancy with, with um, interfaces and such because this is type here, up here, public, and it called stat, fine. <laughs> then we call allocate, and the x is the, the variable that we had here, x. We allocate five elements, and we fill up the vector, one, two, three, four, five. We uh, print x, then we take the mean, of x and here is the typical way to use functions and then we are getting the return value of the function when we do print so then we can say print mean of st of x x is st is in x and print so now we can see what's happening simple object one three fortran simple object one One, two, three, four, five. And the mean is three. Since I had no formatting, you see, you get a lot of decimals. But there's an other observation here. There are no way, there are no way of knowing or nay. We have hidden any anything of the size and type of the variable. You see, type is stat. What is that? It's a single, double, whatever, hidden. And then printing is also hidden. So we, the only way we can see that we, we have here is I, I gave it since I know it's a, it's a float. I gave it floating numbers, but actually the, the variables or the types and so on are encapsulated in the object. So all things that deal with the variables are encapsulated and hidden in the calc module, which is quite nice. But here we are accessing the data which we could also encapsulate away so that we we'll don't have to deal with any kind of data in the in the main program. Simple object two. Here we have we have the the, the type also contains something called called mean. So now we have public stat and, the, and we have 
we have encapsulated away the whole function calc, calc mean, which is the same as before, but we've given it another name in the interface or in the type so that it's only called mean. And this is the same I, I put in mean with, with as a function I put in parentheses doing to show that it's a function. But now I need to use st min since I have this variable here. Now this also contain a function, not only variables, but also a function. Since the type up here contains a function called mean, which points to the calc mean here. So now we are progressing forward with more and more object orientation and encapsulation of things. Of course, same thing. But now we need to use st sin sts x and sts mean. More encapsulation. Soon we could get away with the whole of data and just have something that generates the data. Simple object three. Now we made it a little bit more. We have we have a new type, public stat, but we declare x as public. So the actual vector x is public that we can see. But the average variance, standard deviation, and skew are hidden from us. It contains two procedures calc and show and we of course we have to write the contents of, of calculate but now we see that now we need to add to get hold of of the data that comes into the subroutine now we use this which means this type that we have this is a new keyword this is the actual it's the name of the actual parameter that is being used in the main program. Intention in this is a pointer. There are some variables inside this function. We calculate the mean, we calculate this, uh, the variance and the skew, and we assign them to this var and skew, and they are up here. So they are in here, so they are room for them here. We assign them. These are the local ones. These are the ones that we assign to the in the object. Then we have show statistics. Again, the, the pointer to this object comes in here, which is the actual object that we call from the main. And then we write out some statistics and yeah just show us some some something and i yeah the first five elements and so on and nothing special with that one and then in the main program we still allocate x we fill up the vector x we have because we have access to the x that's the only thing we have access to of the data we print it and we calculate and we show and we, of course we are nice and deallocate the object. So now you see we can to show the data, we use show that will give us show us the variance, the standard deviation and the skew, which are <coughs> hidden from us here. We are not allowed to see these data. The only thing we are allowed to see is X and calc and show. So we can compile it. And we get the first vector, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six elements. Smallest is one, the largest is six. The first five elements are one through five. The mean is three and a half, variance, standard deviation, and the skew. So this is an example of how you 
encapsulate away as much as possible. We only do declare an object of ST type. We have access to the data. So we fill up a vector of some kind, but we don't have access to the statistical values. They are only available in show to see what's happening. So we more or less deal with the data through methods. But we have one more, simple object four. I think there are only four of them. No, they're up to six, I remember wrongly. So now we have the same. We have x, the vector x, but now the vector x is hidden from us. It's private. We can't see. And I put in private up here, so anything is private except those who are publicly declared as public. Uh, they are explicitly declared as public. So stat is public. X, the data, data vector, is hidden. You're not allowed to see that one. The local variables are hidden. The procedures, gen, calc, and show, which point to generate, calculate, and show stat, they are publicly available. And now we are in an interesting way. We say that to generate the data, we of course take in the actual pointer to the object, but I also have M, which how many elements to generate. Since we have a generating subroutine, it needs to know how many elements that we want to, to generate. But I also put in, made that, that M optional. So if we don't give any M, we have to make some default. And the intention, of course, of this is in and out because it, uh, it's a pointer to the, uh, to the object, so it can be both in and out. M is in, but it's optional. J and N are integers. I use, put the N here, like 10, which I use as default if stop given. Then there is a, a nice little thing here. If present, which is a logical function, return true or false. If M is present, N equals M, which means that if, if M is not present, N remains 10. So we update N if there is something to update with. If not, we keep N as 10 if you didn't bother, if you were too lazy to give, to give an argument with the elements. So this is an example to show you how you use optional arguments. Then we allocate this, which is the actual pointer to this object, x of n. We call random seed. We call random number to all the elements here. Then I just multiply by 10 to get some nicer numbers. And we're done. We updated this vector here, x with, with n numbers of, of random random value. Then we calculate, as before, nothing special with this. Then we use the show stat and show the statistics. So main, this object, here you see the only thing we do is to use calc. We declare the object. We have no idea what kind of data we have here, what kind of if they are double, single, integer, whatever, the complex or whatever they are, it's hidden from us. So we now have encapsulated away almost everything. I call st generate. Here I have the m equals to, to 15. I calculate and I show. So now the main program is becoming very simple. No data handling, no nothing. It only used the methods in the object. So four.
can you imagine a supercomputer being that slow? 15 elements. The smallest is 0.8, the largest is 8.7, and blah, blah, and the sum, and the variance, and the skew, etc. So it works. So now we don't, we have encapsulated away everything with the data. So we can go to example number five. Here are, here is objects with pointers. This part here is more or less as before. We have public stat. You see they are more or less the same, but in the main program, there are changes. Main start here. If I use control L here or something, a bit more. Right. Use calc as before, and then I say j equals one and n dt n parameter. So this is fixed to three. Then type stat target dimension sd of n. So now I can have several several instances of st and a pointer. Note that no type declaration. So now I said call st1. Now we have an array of <coughs> an array of, of, uh, of objects. Not a linked list, but an array of pointers. So I said st1 is the first st, and then I generate five. Then I set the pointer to point to st2. That's allowed. The pointer can point which pointer is is of type stat and it's a pointer pt. So it that can point to this object. So I set pt to point to number two. Then I call pt gen, and then I call s3 gen, which I can also do. What you see here is the PT and called S3 just to show that you can do it in several ways. So there is more than one way to skin a cat. Then I use the pointer. I said PT equals J. And then the others are only using PT as the pointer because the pointer is advancing for each gen loop. So there will be three loops here. So this is a way of showing that you can have an array of objects and a pointer pointing to whatever object you like if you declare a pointer. So now we try to run the five. I think it should also be a break soon. What do you think, Tanya? Yes, that would be nice to have a break. But yeah. you can uh, finish have, this. We have one more example that goes through and then it's a break because then that's a, a, a list of pointers. Mm -hmm. Or we can save that for after after the, the break. What do you think? Shall we take a break then? Uh, or, or maybe three minutes are there. So uh, yeah. you, can, you can go through this and. Uh... Yeah. We, um, we have a simple object again. And this time I um, I used um, an interface this object because I put in put in um, simple object I have object subroutine object we have subroutine object up here somewhere. Something generate, something calculate, something stat. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, 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 I am. Um, I declared a new subroutine down here. Ah, that's why I was. So, 
I declared a subroutine object down here. Just to show that you can use the pointer as a parameter. So then what I need an interface to that object here, I need the interface because the compiler is not too happy with, with this one here. So I have an, an, my own subroutine here called object and the interface is up here. And the subroutine the, and the, the program is now only as before this, very simple. Then the interface, but then I say PT set to point to number one, the first element. Then I call object with the pointer and 17. When I call object, it's a subroutine down here. It takes in the pointer and the N, which is 17. Then I use calc, so I have access to all of this. Then I declare P, we need to declare it here as a pointer of type stat and input output. And then the N, which is the how many numbers in the array in type in. <coughs> and then I call P gen, P calc, and P show. This is just to show that you can use the pointer as a parameter and receive it somewhere and have a pointer to point to the whole object. So now it's becoming quite complex using pointers as, as parameters and such. There is no end to how complex you can make it with modern Fortran. And of course the data, the, the result is the same. So this is also showing that pointers can be can be sent as, as parameters. Of course, PT now points to STM1, the first element. And of course, P points to the exactly the same thing. It's just parameters mocking around. And I just put in 17 because it's the most random of all numbers. So now it should be probably nice with them with a little break. But I'll take any questions that might come. No, we can take a break, then there is no question so far. Yeah. Uh, uh, shall we take a 15 minutes break? 15 minutes is nice. Yeah. I so then we, then we have some till... time for, for some questions, and then I'll show an example of, of uh, not a real program, but uh, a, a lookalike real program that can actually be explaining more about the object orientation. So yes. break. So break until 11 dead. Yeah. Right. We we covered through a lot of things and now after this I think we've covered almost the entire fancy things in, in Fortran. Next time will be performance issues and offloading and so on. So there will be no new new constructs and so on 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 the on the last day that will be only how to write for performance how to measure performance and we'll touch upon we'll make offloading but offloading without any any extras only the iso standard language but we haven't covered parallel programming in in none of the sessions but we'll will cover some elements of it, but we'll not use OpenMP and we'll not use open M um, OpenMPI. No threading and no MPI, but we will try to run some examples where we, we try to offload to the accelerator with, with standard ISO Fortran. And of course the same applies to NVIDIA has also options for um, for doing it in C++, but this is Fortran. So we'll, that we'll do next time. So, but there will be no extra fancy things in um, in um, the next uh, session. So the last part, the last hour, we'll, we'll be dealing with um, with more object orientation and, and, and a program I wrote that is reassembling some, some kind of scientific code. Um, I see there are no questions. Um, do come with questions, and of course we are here all uh, available to answer questions 
all the time. So if you come up with some questions later on, you forward to to us and we'll see what we can do and try to answer them. Yes, uh, this uh, this document uh, will be staying here and um, then I will archive this uh, question and, sit and link to the archive document uh, on the same document. But you can ask question after the event also. We will uh, answer it and archive it and you can see. Very good. So, and this is a demo of an, um, an object-oriented program. It this is, should be should be some homework because it's it's um it's a quite elaborate program. I had quite fun when I wrote it, but it was also some in some challenges to get things to work. It's a program that uh, reads some input and 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 do some something with the input and so on. So it's a it's a full fledged program that actually read input and handle and do some calculations, et cetera. And there's also a method how to read the file. And uh, there's a long discussion. I had discussion here and tried other. How do you read an input file? It's not as simple as you will think. And we'll come, we'll scan through it because you don't know how long the input file is. You don't know how many lines there are. And how do you declare a variables or arrays when you don't know how long the file is? So if programming C++, it's very simple. You just make a list and deal with it from there and, and deal with the pointers. But then the performance goes down the drain. You will retire before you get an answer. You see your children will get married and have children and families of their own before you get the answer. So you need to do it properly with arrays and such. And then you need to figure out how long should the arrays be. This is also with uh, dealing with in, in this class demo dot one. I also have a class demo dot two because to show when you first have done the object orientation, how simple it is to expand. But we go through the class demo one first. <laughs> There is a module called data, data object public. It's a type, so that have to be has to be public, and the x and y are actually also public. It contains procedure for import data. Import data here mean reading from the file. Import, import simple, import list, import chain. Import is reading the file. Import simple is uh, dealing in, within in a simple matter. L is for a simple import using a list and a chain of object. Print is obvious. Sum is easy. Write the data out on a file again and read data from a binary file and clean. So. These are the functions that you can, uh, the subroutines that are available. Import, import S, import L, import C, print, sum, write, read, and clean, clean up. So now contains the routines to manipulate the data. Data import. Data import. <laughs> Sorry, I should actually slap myself on the fingers from one of these. Um, Anyone cannot see something that you shouldn't do here? I can actually put put the cursor on the line where the bad things are. Anyone? What's really bad here? You dare to make a guess, Tanya? I you say end hundred uh, that one yes so you hundred is a label label yeah and label is very bad so avoid at all cost labels are very bad so 
I, I, I you'll see how it's done properly in in one of some others here. So to import the data, we when we call when this function uh, this subroutine is called, it's called with the with the object in question, the actual object, and it's a file name. Class object, its data object is intentional in and out. File name is only in, and there are some some um, data like like file unit seventeen will have some sleeve some tricks up our sleeve to to deal with this because you should this is something that you can be lucky to avoid. The first thing we do is to open the file. And of course, what happens if the file is not there? Status is set to old, so it must exist. And if it doesn't exist, it this one crashes because you cannot open a file that doesn't exist with status old. So it will crash. So there should be more lines here. Then, in order to figure out how many numbers there are here, we read the file and record the number of lines. And to show you how the file look like, to make it simpler, x, y, 1.txt, you see the file has a header and it has two numbers per line. Floating point numbers, so there are two numbers per line, which is the format that you have to agree upon so that you don't have four numbers on the line, that there are only two numbers, x and y, for each line. This is also a problem when you deal with input, that you need to have some kind of format on the input. So yeah. may I ask one question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, do loop uh, is it a while a truth statement? Is it when the file exists or? Yeah, if the file doesn't exist here, yeah, on this line. If that file doesn't exist, it crashes. Yeah. So uh, you have this uh, um, do while uh, truth statement uh, statement. Yeah. So is it? Uh, when the file exists, is it that's a true statement or? Yeah, the no, this true. This is a constant. It could actually be just do while, or, okay. or just do. It doesn't have to be do while. But I, 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 I fancied using do while and use the true. So you could okay. actually take away while true. Okay. Yeah, so, that's uh, something I have never seen. Yeah, yeah, but you could have a test here, a real test. That's why I probably put it in. Okay. Um. And of course, this is some kind of, this is very not very good. You jump to label 100. If it end, bad programming. So when the file is at end of file marker, you know that J is equal to J and you have counted up until the file is ended. So J are now the number of lines in the file. But you remember there was a header. You see, this shouldn't be counted. And that's why I said set J to minus one in the beginning. <laughs> so the first one would take J to zero for the header line. This is a little neat trick I came up with. Yeah, that's a nice trick uh, because uh, what I was doing earlier, like uh, read the first line, read uh, this, and then go to the do loop. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's another way of doing it. Yeah, because, but now I'm not reading anything here. I just said A could be anything here, character, whatever. You see, I don't read the line. I read the line, but I don't care what it is. I just read the number of lines. So this one reads the file just to figure out counting up the number of lines. Yeah. We have different ways of doing it. So this is one simple way, reading the, but this time, this one needs to read the file two times. Then I use the label, which is bad, but I, I included it here to show that this is something that you might encounter. Then I did the allocate statement 
correctly. I said this and the X with, with J and the Y with J, and then I have the setting the result to stop. So if something goes wrong, the allocation fail, and I exit the program by call to exit of one. So if the result status is different from zero, allocation fail, and there's nothing we can do with an exit, then the whole program abort. Then I rewind the file, spool back to the begin, tape to the beginning. Then I say J equals one, because that's the first element. Then I read in do while true again. First, I read the header. I read the header in text into the, this header. Then I read here, I read file name, free format. We don't know what to expect. I check the IO stat. If there are some strange thing there, it will exit. It will not exit the program. It will just exit the loop. Because if we have read 10 numbers and some garbage comes, then I keep the 10 numbers and we stop there. So we only read 10 numbers and, and be happy with that. So, so then I check the IO status. If it's different from zero, I just exit the loop and we get out of the loop at end, uh, after end do. Control is to end do. Ex um, exit is the exiting the, the loop, the do loop. And then, of course, I, I fill the data into X and Y. If there are characters there or something strange that, that the read statement cannot, in some sensible way, put into variables, it will, IOSTAT will also be different from zero. And of course, end of file is also different from zero. <laughs> Close the file and we fill the vectors. So, can we do it in another way? Yes, we can. I put in import data simple. Again, this, this is the current object, file name, file unit 17 again, line can be up to 132 characters long. I start to allocate zero just to have some something allocated the zero zero length but it means that it is allocated at least that the existence is allocated and i test if it allocates okay <laughs> it does then i open the file file name old action read iostat equals iost I check now if the file exists or not. If this one is different from zero, I print out file not found, exiting, and I call exit of one and terminate the program. Then we start reading the file. We read the header. As you talked about earlier, Daniel, you just had one statement that you read. So this is how I do it now. Then I start reading it in a loop. And this is a nice trick. This is very elegant programming. Performance-wise, it's questionable, but this is very elegant. This was introduced in 2003. This vector here, x, is appended another element. So I have a vector x of length n, and then I append an element to have a new vector with, with length n plus 1. The flip side of this is that it needs to be, to be reallocate and deallocate and so on in behind the scenes. So performance-wise, it might encounter some problem. But this is very elegant because you only need to read the file once but it might consume some memory since it needs to be reallocate and allocate. So it's very elegant to program and it's easy to understand. So this is probably my preferred way of doing it. If something goes wrong with IOSTAT, we exit the loop, jump out. So control is 
is out here to end to. Close the file, file name, and we read the data. Then can we use a linked list? Can we use a linked list of objects? Of course we can. This is somewhat smarter. We still have the subroutine import list. We have made ourselves an object called line. Line contains X and Y real numbers. It contains a pointer to the next line. So here we here we declare an object that point to itself called next. Then we declare a type pointer, pointer first, current and hold. We declare two variables for reading the data from the file. We use allocate, allocatable data, X and Y. And then we nullify the pointers and then we open the file. And again, check the file. And then we read the header. Then we start doing here is, you see the loop here doesn't contain any anything else than the do loop. So this is equivalent to do while true. An infinite loop. We read the data X and Y, check whether or not it could be read correctly. We can, we allocate a new object. We check if the allocation works nice, it does. So we come here. We assign the current x to xx, same for y. Then we let current point with currents next, point to the first one. We update the previous link. Then we put first to current. And we're done with the loop. We point current to the first one. Now we have all the data points and we can allocate the vectors. We know how many there are. We allocate, check if it's okay. Then we start if not associated, then we have reached the end of the list. And if exit from the loop, from, from, from the whole exit, exits the do loop, not the if test. Then we said X of J set to current X x sin y subtract because we're reading the list backwards hold set to current current set to next the next in the list deallocate hold and continue after we're done the list should be empty and we check and we have read the data into the vectors then we have again another way of, of one more way of doing it by a chain chain list slightly different but not not that differently we uh, we um, have a pointer again yl and y xl and X, and then next we nullify we allocate and we read the file if it's something wrong we exit and we read the header, then we read the we read straight into current x y uh, x l and y l. We exit the loop. We allocate next one. So now we know we have a linked list, and we know exactly how long the arrays are. We can allocate the arrays. We can check if the allocation is okay. We don't bother with that. <clears throat> we check if the current next is associated. If the next element exists, then not exist, we exit. If it, if it do exist, we, we continue. Fill it in, flip around the pointers, increase the J. Now we are reading the data in the correct correct um, manner. So there are several ways of reading the input file. So, but this one, if you read, if you read this file a single time, only once, you need to hold two times the data in, in 
memory. If you read the file twice, you only need to have the data once in memory. So it's a trade-off. Of course, the, the sensible thing is to have a header saying how many lines there are, because the, some program must have written the file or you have written it yourself. So you should know how many lines there are. But yeah. So now we have read the file in different way, different ways. We can have go to our next subroutine, which is printing the data. We have intention of for in and then some format. Here I have putting in the format directly into the declaration f6 and two times x for two x and, and the two floating point numbers with the two blanks between uh, one blank um i print out some numbers the first 10 of the first 10 numbers and i print out some more some so so some more lines after I print so because you can print all the lines I print out three more and then I have a subroutine function called sum data sum which is just adding x and y together with s and the result is s then we have something this this is a nice one here I have the data. I have X and Y data. So I now open a file in unformatted format. That means that there is no conversion. The bits as they are stored in memory are written to the file. So raw, so to say. So totally unformatted. The image in the memory are written to the file exactly as is. And it's called a write action. I print the header. Then I print the vector there and there. So I can print a vector, the whole vector in just one statement. And I can even print two vectors in one statement, closing the file. So read is reading the unformatted file, which is also very simple. I open the file, unformat it, but this time for action read. I read the header. I read the two variables. I read the two vectors again. I have some cleanup to do. And this is the whole thing that this is all the module data that we have. Now, there is only the main program. Main class demo. We use we use we call in for to use the data module with all those elements that we have. Then we declare an object called uh, object. We have a file name and argument character two and a logical present. Some magic to interact with the users. I print out demo of classes in Fortran. Then if the command line argument, so this is another <laughs> another first. Command line argument, if it's less than one, then you didn't print anything, only the name of the program. And I print out the usage, call exit two. Two is, is misuse. And I think this is appropriate here that you are not, using the program correctly. So I, I call out exit two. Then I get the first argument, if present. Then I get the second argument. The first argument is the, is the name of the executable. Then I get the second argument, put it into the file name, read. I read the print, I re read file, which is the name of the file. Then I check if there is a dot in the file name. This is just to show that you can use some 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 fancy name of, of finding an index.
<clears throat> then I do something that we can also do. I check if the file exists because I ask you to give a file name. Of course, you can give anything and the users can 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 put in any strange characters. So I check if the file name exists with inquire exists equals present. If not present, file not found using a default xy.txt. I inquire if that also ex is there. If that isn't there, I totally exit. Call exit two. Then I use the our old friend the case thing. I C or capital C for object chain, object list, smart vector append, and simple. S for simple. And now we have decided what to do. We call the file name. This is the, the, the binary file called class.dta. We print the header. We print some data, some sizes of, of the data. We have access to the data here, so also some of the functions. The functions are OK, but we also have a, a we have access to the data. I haven't declared them them um, private. We write out the file name, clear data, and read and read it in again. Print out and check, and we're done. Quite a comprehensive program. We'll see if it works. This is something that you could review as homework. OK, we have xy.txt, some data, and a header. So yeah, and that file not found using xy.txt. So why didn't it of course? Of course. I need to read how to you how do I use my own program? You see? Now it's an example of how useful it is to write a usage. If I hadn't had a usage, I had to either review the documentation, which is non-existing, or I had to read the source code. But if I'm smart enough to include a usage, it shows how here how to run run the, the program. Of course, I should have used C and then XY TXT. <coughs> now it works. So always include a usage if you are expecting some and to be nice to users and yourself to, two days after you wrote the program, you have forgotten, forgotten how to run it. So we give the file, we give C object chain and the file. We read the file. This is the header for the first file that we know. This, there are 43 numbers. The sum is here. The 10 first line look like this, and the last lines look like this. We clear the data and read, and then you write it out. We clear data and read the binary file. We get the header. We get the 10 first lines. They are the same. And the last four lines are there. They are the same. So. These are the, this is the binary file. It's not big, it's 784 bytes. And if you use file on it to check what it is, it's data. If I open in Emacs, it will be a just rubbish. But these are the double precision number exactly as they are stored in memory. So a quite comprehensive program. Now comes the beauty. 
we done all this class junk or exercises before. But now we can show that when we have done an object, remember here, when we get down to the, to here, there is only one object here. I only declare a single object. We only used one object to contain a data set in that file. So, but there is nothing to stopping us from using many objects. The, the, I've updated some of, of, the, of the routines here. I input a debug, so you can write out debugs. I um, I got rid of the the label. I I used inquire and so on. And the let me see here is the main program. You see now. The type of object is a pointer and it's called head hold traverse. So now there is not a single object. We only declare a pointer to an object. And then we have a linked list of many objects, which make it a bit more complicated. But then we'll see here. When I write demo classes in Fortran, data sets is equal to command argument count. And the usage is a dot out, file one, file two, file three, up to file n. And we need at least one input file. So we can now have n objects that we only had one in the first place. We can have as many as we like. It's just how many files do you bother to, to input on the command line. And then we run through the data sets just to print out the files. If you wanted to have, if you wanted to have um, a debug info. And then we check, we check if the files exist, all of them. If none, if some of them do not exist, we just exit the whole thing because if the user put in a non-existent file, then there's not much we can do except saying that file not found and then name of the file that wasn't found. Then we import the traverse, scene import of file name. So we fill up the first object with that. Then we print it and we we scan for a dot to check if we need to make an object to name a binary file with data. So we have some, some similar name. I change the file name to instead of x.y and something dot txt to the same dot dta. This is string manipulation in Fortran, it's not that hard. Print out if we want to, call write and call read, print the header, allocate, run through the objects and clean. A bit more complicated than the first one. So, It's an example of a, of a larger program, which is actually meant more as a homework than anything else. So now we we just need to feed in files. And of course, since we are having a list of objects, 
we can fill in the data structure as we like. So here, this is the header for the first one, XY, 43. Header for the last one, 41. For the number three, 43 in this one. X4, 44. And for the number five one, and for XY, the last one. And then I print out a run through the headers of the object so that readers can see that they're the name and the, the, the binary name and then the sum. But we'll also have binaries here. These are the raw files that now contains binary data. So that it's easier to read in. So this was an example of, of a more comprehensive program that you could, could um, have as a review. But then again, object orientation is, is very nice, but if it's how much applic applicable it is to, to large climate models and such is, is another story. So many people mean that the vector Syntax, etc., is more important to learn than 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 object orientation and, and classes. But I thought it was an interesting thing to see that you can write quite complex stuff. And when you have made an object, it's so easy to replicate the object to make as many as you like. So object orientation is very very powerful, but it's not applicable to anything. So that's it for today. I mean, we covered a lot of ground and we've been through most of the things that you will, most of the things that is available in Fortran and also demonstrated that it's a very modern language. The latest standards out is 2018. 2023 is um, okay or is, um, went through the, the committee. So, it is, is approved by the committee and they are now working on 2020Y, which they talk about could be updated in 2028. But the 2003 standard will, 2023 standard will be out quite soon with a, a few interesting things added. So Fortran is absolutely modern. So it's a language for the future and language for, from the past and also into the future. And that time we have 20 minutes to to some Q and A and and questions and answers and so on. So yeah, uh, I I I just want to thank the ladies took an enormous effort to uh, prepare these uh, examples. When I go through the examples, I could see the effort you put it uh, put on uh, for this, and I really ap appreciate. And I. I hope people who watch this and who will watch the videos will appreciate the same. Thanks a lot. And thank you for the participation today. And uh, we look forward to the final event of the series next month. Mm. And if there is any question, we can take it and I will uh, stop recording. And once again, thanks. <laughs>